right, good evening. I am uncertain how well this is going to turn out, so I'm just going for it. It is about 3.30 right now, so I figure I would just get on here and try out my first just kind of talking about stuff video. Um, unscripted, I, I don't have anything prepared previously. I just thought I would talk a little bit about my career. Um, I made some mistakes early on, and they're, I mean, I, I guess they're mistakes that all authors make. We we jump into this game and we don't have a damn clue what we're doing, uh, and I'm, I'm no different. Uh, you know, of course, when I started, I was, I was under the impression this job would be easy. I figured that very first book, uh, You know, if, if everything went according to plan, and I tried to plan as best I could, I figured that first book I would be settled, and it would make enough money that I could just write full time and be happy with my life, um, or not having to scrape by to make sure all the bills were paid, and you know, have a, provide a good life for my daughter and everything else. And life just doesn't work that way. Uh, at least it doesn't for me. You know, there are the few who make it very easy, but you know, the thing we don't see about that is how much work was put into it before they made it. And I, I think that's the that's kind of the key where a lot of it gets lost is there's so much work put into it, and nobody ever sees that. They don't ever see it until somebody becomes big enough they they draw public attention, become that celebrity status, so to speak. So. I was guilty of thinking it would be easy, um, and, and don't get me wrong, this isn't, you know, this isn't me complaining about how hard life is and all that. Life's hard for everybody. Get the fuck over it, do something about it, and move on. Um, but I will talk a little bit about what I am doing. Um, for those that don't know, and if you're here, you should already, my name is Samuel Reichard. Um, I started writing back in 2009, and my first book was published in 2013 um, through New Babel Books. It was The Forge of Feast, a cookbook that was done in a fantasy style, and to this day, the book gets a lot of attention. Uh, I usually can't take it to a show without selling out during the show, and then I have to go buy more from my publisher while he's there. Um, but, you know, that, that was my first book, and I kept writing, I kept working on my own stuff, and I eventually discovered the world of self-publishing, or indie publishing, as a, we in the industry call it. Um, I learned pretty quickly that with the creative control I had over my own stuff, I was able to make more money in a shorter period of time than I was able to traditionally publishing. That's not to say that I've cut ties with them. I, I still work with them whenever I can. Uh, but there's a lot more that goes into the indie publishing role of things than there is in the traditionally published. Um, traditionally published, basically, you write the book, you you know, send it to them. They go through it, tell you what they do and don't want. They usually send it back. You go through three to four stages of revisions before the manuscript's finally where they like it at, and then they put it together. And you buy copies if you need to, and then basically you just collect royalties on it. And it would be nice if that was the way the world worked, but without that extra work and most of these publishers don't put they don't not all of them know how to market properly and that's where the problem comes in is without a book being marketed properly it's not going to go anywhere I mean, there's just no way around it and not unless you've already got an established platform you're a, you're a big named author in which case, you drop a book, people find out about it, and people are going to jump on it. I mean, that's just the way celebrity works. 
but when you're not a celebrity you don't get that so you have to market the book and get it out in front of people if it's going to go anywhere that's a lot of work I spend in fact every single day I'm doing something to either learn how to market better or to revise something I've already got going in order to get the marketing stuff working a little bit more smoothly uh, which sadly it's not a it's not a set it and forget it platform uh, none of it is uh, even if you have everything set up proper and perfect for a month or two like technology you know you can't buy a cell phone and have it up to date for more than a couple months something newer something supposedly better is going to come out uh, and then you're no longer you're no longer up to date and marketing's the same way by the time you learn what's happening and you figure it all out things change so therefore you have to get on you have to make your revisions figure out what's changed and then proceed accordingly it's a never-ending process um, so I made mistakes early on stuff that I didn't know were mistakes at the time and most authors don't like I say we we all fall into this trap and I've reached a point in my career where I can identify those mistakes but I can't fix all of them and it, it sucks I, I wish I could or at least I can't fix them in a timely manner um, I have really two choices if I'm going to fix them I can either just continue to move forward and put out new stuff without making the mistakes of the past and eventually things will smooth out which in truth that's probably one of the better ways to to move on the other thing I can do is I can keep struggling I can keep augmenting I can keep revising I can keep doing all of this shit to fix the mistakes I've made and it may fix them eventually but I can't plan for that uh, and you know I'm the type if I'm gonna do something I need to be able to plan for it and that just doesn't work so the third option uh, is revising my entire platform or not necessarily revising I'm essentially wiping the slate um, you know I'm not I'm not quitting by any means don't don't assume that I, I'm, I'm too stubborn to quit um, but I've I've pulled pretty much everything I have creative control over I've pulled it's no longer available online and if you see it available online then that's because some of these some of these pirated sites and, and assholes like that they whenever your book goes live they receive a list I don't know how I don't know if it's given by Amazon or I don't know really how they get it but when a new book publishes these third-party sites start slapping it up as if they have the book and they hike the price up on it or you know some shit like that and then if somebody buys from them then they order it from Amazon and I, I'm not entirely certain how all of that works uh, I've talked to many of them and most of them are just assholes about it uh, you know the short of outright threatening them they will not pull it off of their site even though they have no right to it so then you run into the issue which I've, I have done in the past uh, where you drop a title you make it no longer available and then you explain to them you know listen you either pull this down or I'm gonna order a copy from you myself and since you can't you can't receive it anymore because it's no longer available that means you're gonna have to order it straight from me and I'm gonna boost the price so much that you're losing a hell of a lot of money on it uh, either that or you know face backlash for not upholding that deal so and they'll, they'll usually drop it that way uh, but you know it's a pain in the ass having to pull a product down just to make a point so, you know, I don't know how I really, how I really got off onto that tangent, but uh, you know, all of my books 
with the exception of a select few, have been pulled. Uh, and the reason for this is because I'm going through and I'm, I'm revising everything. I'm, I'm making everything better. And here in a few months, everything will pop back up in a strategic plan that should give everything a fresh start. Uh, if everything goes right, it will give it a fresh start. Uh, which will basically mean that I will be starting out as a, a new author without all of my previous books under my name. Uh, I mean, those that are staying, my traditionally published stuff, and uh, you know, Damn It Bree will be staying where it's at just because it can't, it can't feasibly go anywhere else. Um, but, you know, those, those select books will be staying, and I still will be publishing occasionally under Samuel Reichard. But I'm slowing this side of things down. Um, and there's a lot of work going into this. I mean, I, I'm not going to go into details just because it'll kind of screw up all of my plan. But I'm basically, everything that I've done in the past decade, I am doing again, only without mistakes, at least without mistakes to the best of my ability. I'm certain a few mistakes will still pop up, but, you know, that's life. You fix them as you go, or you know, one way or another. I'm doing all of this in about three months. Uh, you know, as well as trying to continue my current schedule of getting new books written. You know, I'd already said earlier in this year that this year was going to be a slow one. I, I wrote seven books last year and published four or five of them. Uh, this year is mostly, I intend to release at least about two books this year is my intention. Um, but I want to write more than that. I, I want to get, I'd like to get about four or five books ahead. That way I can release them when I, when I want to instead of just when they get done. And of course in all of that I have the the issue of editors and artists and marketing and ad copy and there's there's so much that goes into making a successful book and you know if you consider the price of all of that most most of your editors and art or sorry most of your editors and artists the going rate for most of them is about five hundred dollars per book so. For each new book goes out, let's say I pay an editor $500, I pay an artist $500 for the cover art. Uh, that's that's a thousand dollars, and we're not even getting into proofreaders or anything spent on ads and all that. So I mean, you know, don't let it deter you as far as if you want to become an author, uh, because those prices aren't they're not required. I mean, you don't have to hire these people to do this. It's, it's very recommended just because they're entirely different skill sets that you will have to learn in order to be successful. Um, you know, you'll, you'll either have to learn them yourself or you need to pay somebody to do them or you're going to have an inferior product. I mean, there's just really no way around that. Um, you know, I've, I've personally have gotten good enough now that most of the time whenever I read through and edit a book m most of the time I catch more things than what the editors that I pay catch which that's not necessarily a good thing um, but you know we're human we make mistakes we miss things it happens and a lot of that's because I have a trick where rather than just trying to read through it and rather than just read through and try to catch things by eye I will copy and paste an entire manuscript into a text-to-speech program, and then I just sit there and push play, and I listen to it. And if something doesn't sound right, you know, because the text-to-speech programs, they don't autocorrect, which is the problem, is, you know, computer and our brain, all that shit autocorrects. So by listening to it, I can hear when something doesn't sound right, and then I can go into the manuscript itself and fix it. You know, I, I follow along yeah, while listening to it, and I fix it that way. So I find so many errors that way that, that our brains just miss because we get used to a pacing and then we just skip over something. It, it happens. Um, so, I mean, there's 
that's one solution if you are a new author or somebody that can't afford to pay or hire an editor. You know, that is one thing you can do to get rid of most of your mistakes. But it still helps to have somebody that knows what to do and take a look at it. Uh, as far as the artist side of things or artist side of things go, you know, there's a formula to creating a good book cover. And I've I've spent a lot of time researching and learning it. Uh, in fact, I actually I went through and I pulled a, a bunch of the uh, a bunch of the top book covers in sci-fi and fantasy because that's where I work. And I I pulled them all, I copy or I right clicked and saved the cover. And I put all of them in one document so I could look at them all side by side. And then I wrote up a list of similarities between them. And I found about 10 similarities that all of these best-selling book covers had and uh, so I figure any cover I do going forward is going to follow or at least contain those 10 similarities with all the best-selling books um, and by doing that that puts me puts me on the same page as them as far as the way the book looks I mean in truth when when you get down the brass tacks in order to be a successful author I'm going to say this, but I want you to realize that there's more to follow this. So don't just take this as for what it is initially. But in order to be a successful author, it doesn't matter what's inside your book. It doesn't matter how well or how good of a writer you are. It doesn't matter how good the story is. None of that matters. If you're going to sell your book, you have to have sales initial sales not not secondary I mean having a good product having something that's well written that reads well reads smoothly and keeps people's attention all of that is in having a good product and I want to have a good product I mean that's just a matter of pride but those are important factors for return readers uh, people that you know read one book and they liked it so then they want to read your next book if you want return readers, you have to have a good product. But you can't get return readers without having initial sales, uh, initial readers. And the only way to get initial readers is by having a good looking cover that, again, meets the minimum requirement for a good looking cover. Uh, you know, people say don't judge a book by its cover, but it happens all the time. It happens every day. You know, I'm, I'm guilty of it myself and I know better. Um, so, I mean, you have to have a good cover that catches people's attention and tells a story all on its own. You know, you, I can look at a cover and tell you what genre that book falls into if it's covered properly. I mean, that was one of the problems I had with Shields was... It's a long story with Shields. Uh, but the cover that it ended up having was... It was a last-minute thing just to get the book ready for its launch because the launch date was coming up. And there was a problem with the cover that I had paid for, and I had to have something. So I, I was sick as a dog, and I threw that to cover last, or threw that cover together last minute. And I pulled my ass out of bed. I was sick for a week. Pulled my ass out of bed, sat down, and put that cover together in about two hours. And it shows. I mean, it wasn't a good cover by any means. Uh, some people liked it. I wasn't one of them. And the reason being is because that cover did not tell the story that was within the book. And that's that's part of the thing is you have to, if you're going to do this, your cover has to match the story. I mean, you, you can't expect a, a fast-paced action thriller and have a romance cover on it. It just, it doesn't work. So, um, I mean, your cover has to match your genre. It has to tell a story. Somebody has to be able to look at it and know. Okay, this cover is this, so I know that this is a urban fantasy, or this is a romantic comedy, uh, or a straight romance, uh, sci-fi fantasy. I mean, it doesn't matter. Your cover has to match. Um, which your title does a similar job. It's a little smaller. I mean, you have to. You want to have a catchy title that's easy, to re easy to remember, but you also want your title to kind of tell a story. <clears throat> And it needs to coincide with both the story itself and the cover. Um, so book cover is your number one thing to get initial sales. 
If your cover's interesting, you've pulled them in. Your very next thing is your book description. Uh, this will either be either be the description on the author or on the Amazon page or whatever platform your books are being uh, being distributed from. The description is the next important thing. You've you pulled them in by a good cover. And then you have to have a good description, and, and I'm still working on this. I, I study. I've been listening to podcasts. Um, I've been reading articles on it. I know the formula. I haven't figured out how to efficiently follow said formula. Um, you know, you want to start out, you want to hook. You know, you've... you've You've already piqued their interest with a good looking cover. Now they're reading the description to find out if it's a book they would actually spend money on. You need a attention grabbing line, the hook, as your very top. Uh, and then after that, then you go into what the book's about. And you don't want a bunch of fluff. You don't, you know, it can't be like every other book, otherwise you're just gonna get bored and move on. I mean, you want something to pique their interest and draw them in, make them want more. And if they can get through all of that, then they're more likely to purchase the book. And, you know, and they see that, you know, I like the way this description reads. It hooks my interest. It keeps me wanting more. It keeps me reading. So they imagine whatever's inside your book is going to be the same way. And there's, you can pay copywriters um, for, for that process. I mean, all of this you can pay people for. Um... You know, you'll probably pay them a shit ton of money. It's easier just to learn it yourself and get good at it. But again, that requires learning an entire new skill set. Um, so description, you do all of that. At the end of it, you want a call to action, and that's because people follow. They uh, they have to be told what to do. It's a psychology or psychological thing. I don't fully understand it, but. Uh, if you don't tell them what to do, they're just going to move on. So usually, you know, hey, if you if you want to know more, buy the book. Um, you know, t tell them what to do. Give them a give them a call to action. Uh, and you see that everywhere, from websites to to good descriptions. Uh, pretty much everywhere, you have to tell them what to do. Otherwise, they're not going to do it. And you know, that was one of the things that I learned whenever I was a paramedic. Was you know somebody's somebody's hurting on the ground and you you run up and start doing your your thing um you know you have a crowd of people standing around you nobody knows what the hell to do it's your job to remain calm take charge of the situation uh you know whenever you tell someone to call 911 if you just if you just say hey someone call 911 nobody's gonna do it you didn't tell anybody to do it I mean, you, you said it but you left it as a generalization and nobody follows that you know they all assume somebody else is going to do it so that's one of the first things you're taught you point at one random person you say hey you call 911 and that gives that person a direct and specific order and they are more likely to do it than just giving a generalization that says hey somebody call 911 that one person will do it most of the time Unless they're just an asshole, in which case call somebody else, tell them to do it. But, so, you need a call to action to tell them what to do. Um, the next thing is reviews. You know, and that this is the hardest one to get. I've begged and pleaded and even offered gifts. and or not necessarily gifts per se, but you know, I've, I've offered... Uh, I've offered free books and, and other stuff. You know, I make a lot of stuff. Um, I've offered tons of stuff just to help try to get people involved to leave reviews and I can get people to give me their money much easier than I can get them to spend five seconds to leave a free review I, I don't know why but it's just the way it happens so Book description piques their interest, calls them in, they read the description, they like the way it sounds, so they're interested in the book. And then they're, if they're still not dead set, I mean, if you've got a good description, you've pretty much got the sale right there. But people like me, we, even if the description's good, we want to know more. We want to know what other real people think about it. So we scroll down and we check out the reviews. And if there's a bunch of 
bunch of negative re reviews, then we're like, uh, I'm not going to like this book. So they, you know, will step away from it. But if there's a, a fair number of good reviews, which typically we as authors like to have about 50 reviews. They say it takes between 40 and 60 for people to accept it and accept it as legit because that's too many for somebody to just you know gather up and have a bunch of reviews thrown together so 40 to 60 is kind of a sweet spot as far as reviews now more than that great I'm gonna keep going but uh, in fact a lot of times when you're hitting a hundred or more reviews then most people are like okay there's something genuine here but a lot of times those people are spending a shit ton of money on advertisements and they've done they've done their other stuff right. I mean, they may not have the description just right, but they have the cover that follows the formula. Uh, usually, they're a bestseller status in at minimum three categories. Um, but you know, reviews that's that's the next one. And again, that's probably the hardest part to get, just because you cannot do it yourself. You have to have other people. There's a damn flyer in here somewhere. Um. Anyway. To get your initial sales, those are the three key things you want. After that, you want to have a good product that brings those same people back for future books. Um, you know, the problem I run into, I don't have a quick or easy solution to the mistakes that I made early on. So I'm fixing those the best way I can in the, not necessarily a shortcut, but I'm fixing them as best I can in the most direct way I can in the shortest amount of time possible just because I'm I'm getting exhausted um, not necessarily with writing I, I enjoy writing I'm getting exhausted with all of the marketing stuff and learning everything I can to to try to make stuff work and nothing working and again, this isn't this isn't a woe is me story. This is just you know this is how it is, uh, and I'm doing all I can to fix it. So and I'm I'm still working. I'm still I'm doing my best to fix it, um, and I will continue to do such until said happens. Um, but at this point, I'm I'm basically tripling my workload in order to make all of this happen. And I'm, I'm not going to be on here too much longer, probably about another three minutes. We'll give it about a full 30-minute video. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm relaunching everything in order to fix mistakes that I made early on with the hope of not making those same mistakes again. And, you know, I've wondered if what I'm doing is the correct way. I don't know. I flipped a coin and said, sure. So, and, you know... That's one way that I've, I've always lived my life, is if I'm not sure about something, um, I'll flip a coin on it. I'll let fate take the decision. And I uphold whatever the coin says. I, I, don't, I don't cheat it. I don't flip it two or three times. Do one flip, whatever it says. That's the route I'll go. I mean, worst case scenario, it doesn't work, in which case I'll try something new. So. Anyway, um... Working on a new book. Well, I've, I've been working on this book for a while. Uh, but I, I ended up writing a chapter and a half this evening, which was good. So, with all of this other stuff, I haven't been able to spend as much time writing as I like to. So it's good that I'm still making progress and moving forward on that one. I, I look forward to it being finished pretty soon so I can read through it and make my first few sets of revisions before I send it off to the editor. Um, working on book covers, that's a pain in the ass. Um, I've had a few issues with author, or not author, uh, artists lately, which is kind of what I was getting into earlier. Um, I've noticed that most of them seem to, you have to stand over their shoulder and hold their hand the whole process, and I can't work that way. Um... You know, I'm the type, if you need something done, you tell me about it, you tell me when you need it by, and I'll make it happen. It'll get done. And I haven't been able to find that particular trait with most of the artists that I've worked with. Uh, and nothing against them. I mean, life happens. 
you know, they, they have their own shit going on. I get it, but, you know, I work under deadlines. I expect them to as well. Um, so I've kind of, I've gotten frustrated with some of the artists. So I got the, uh, basically the same equipment they have. Mine maybe not nearly as as good, but, you know, it does the same job. And I have been learning how to do digital art. I can draw on paper all day long. I'm pretty good at it. Um, but I'm having to train myself to do so digitally. And that's, it's a learning process. I'm not where I need to be yet, but I'm, I'm close. Uh, if nothing else, I found that with the drawing pad, it already makes it easier to do photo editing and stuff like that. So we'll go from there. But anyway that's that's about all i'm going to say tonight uh, i wanted to give this about 30 minutes and we're coming up on 31 right now so anyway you have a good evening uh if you've watched this thank you uh, if you can find my my book still feel free to check them out um, again please leave reviews and you guys have a good night we will talk to you later bye